is Sirius XM Doctor Radio. This is a Doctor Radio special, Solutions for Back Pain. Your host, Chief of Neurosurgery at NYU Langone Hospital, Brooklyn, Dr. Eric Anderer. Doctor Radio. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Doctor Radio on Sirius XM Channel 110. We're live from NYU Langone Health. Uh, we're listening to the Back Pain Special, which is a special that we do quarterly. We talk about all things spine and back pain related. Um, I hope some of you were able to catch the first hour, which was awesome. We had Grayson Wickham and Amy Stein, who are two doctors of, uh, of physical therapy on. We were talking about non-surgical ways to treat spine pain. Um, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to bring to you this hour Dr. Daniel Choi, who is an orthopedic spine surgeon at Long Island Spine Specialist and a fellowship trained uh, uh, who, uh, spine surgeon who's got a special focus in minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, once again, my name is Dr. Eric Anderer. I'm the chief of neurosurgery at NYU Langone Hospital, Brooklyn, and I'm also a spine specialist and an assistant professor of neurosurgery here at NYU. Um, you can uh, find me on the normal social media channels, Instagram and Facebook. That's at Dr. Eric Anderer, D R E R I C H A N D E R E R. And Dan, you've, you're familiar with Instagram, right? Absolutely. What's your handle? My handle is at SpineDocNY. All right. So um, the interesting thing is this is actually, this is, that's actually how we met, um, right, Dan? Like, it's awesome. I, uh, I, I actually myself just opened an Instagram account because a couple months ago because I figured, hey, all the young people are doing it. Um, <laughs> but it's also a good way, I think, to get um, you know, a message out to a lot of people really quickly. Um, people are increasingly looking to social media um, I mean, the Internet in general, but social media in particular as a source of information, right? I mean, it's something I, I see patients all the time now where they're like, oh, I saw your post on this and mm -hmm. it intrigued me. So clearly you're the kind of doctor I want to see because you aren't somebody that's going to basically jump right to surgery or something. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. So, that, um, so anyway, that's uh, and, you know, Dan, you're obviously like really, really into this. What what do you see are the major utilities to social media and all for let's say, patient education. Sure, absolutely. And Eric, thanks for having me on. Uh, this is a pleasure to be here. And Super fun, um, It was great, actually. Uh, Eric tells how we met on Instagram. It's kind of a fun story. Uh, I started my Instagram account maybe 10 months ago uh, just to kind of explore the medium and see what uh, could be done through that. And uh, I found it, it's uh, actually a very interesting medium because there's uh, I think medical information is kind of new on Instagram. It's mm -hmm. a very new thing. It used to be dominated by plastic surgeons, really. That's where kind of the uh, explosion of medical information happened un under plastic surgeons. That makes the most sense, right? Because yeah. it's like th they're the ones that have like the typical sort of Instagram worthy type pictures, right? Because they're all these like really, really um, uh, beautiful sort of before and after exactly. pictures and all that. So, you know, most of us aren't super photogenic and like, what am I? I'm not going to be taking pictures of someone's spinal cord necessarily. So, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to kind of participate in the media, or at least you have to sort of think about how it is you're going to participate in the medium. Absolutely. I think yeah. in the last five years since Instagram has been popular, it's really been dominated by plastic surgeons, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in the last year or so, we've noticed an explosion of other specialties. So radiology, cardiology, um, all these other specialists who are coming on board and also kind of sharing their content and their uh, um, uh, take on mm -hmm. their specialty on Instagram. So uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the studies, even by the Pew Research Center, uh, they've shown that patients are going to the Internet for pretty much, you know, they Google mm -hmm. all their questions. So right. they have back pain. They're going to Google you know, what exercises am I going to do for back pain? They're going to the Internet, and they're also going to the Internet to look for their physicians, too, mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse, to be honest. And, you know, WebMD, all those things that, you know, 10 years ago we were talking about Dr. Google and whatnot, mm -hmm. it's becoming just kind of the mainstay and what p patients are doing. And I, I've read something somewhere that something like on the order of 40-some-odd percent of patients actually get medical information from social media. Which Absolutely, is, and that's yeah. actually, I've, I haven't heard that statistic, but I'm not surprised, to yeah. be honest. I'm not surprised by that. And, uh, yeah, so, and it's interesting, too, just, you know, and again, being sort of like, you know, the old fogey in the room, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I mean, astounded about the amount of people that are out there putting out information, and it's really great, I mean, in a lot of ways, but in a lot of other ways, it's, it's unregulated, right? So, it's I mean, anyone can put anything up. Um, the one problem with social media is, obviously, you can pretty much say you're anything. Exactly. Right? It's like hiding behind an avatar, hiding behind some mm -hmm. kind of persona. 
um, you can put anything up, which is Absolutely. great if like you know you're trying to find your high school ex-girlfriend. But <laughs> if you're out there <laughs> being a being a physician or a, or a nurse or a PA or a student trying to put out information, mm-hmm. um, you know you kind of want to make sure that. If you're getting the information, you know you kind of know who it is that's giving you the information, right? Absolutely. Um, so that's that's sort of a seg into something. Like I just wanted to talk briefly about sure. like uh, what the, the there's um, been a campaign out that I saw um, that I participated in with you about yep. um, about just sort of being transparent about your credentials and what your perspective is because everybody's got a perspective um, top down. I mean, everybody has a perspective on this and it's just important. I think people understand what that perspective is. Right? Absolutely. So I think, you know, in medical training, you know, the, you went through a neurosurgical residency, a fellowship and all that. And now you're practicing, we're specialists in a certain field. Uh, and all of, uh, just in medical school, we're kind of hammered uh, in our education. Uh, it, they hammer over our heads. Like, you really uh, kind of have to uh, speak true to what you know mm-hmm. and what you're experienced in. It doesn't do the patient uh, any favors uh, to kind of, you know, you know, I'm not going to give advice on, I don't know. Inflammatory bowel disease. Exactly. <laughs> right. I'm not going to give, right. you know, right. on, or on baby delivery advice right. or anything like that because that's not what I'm trained in. And so I'm really uh, going to try to, I guess, in one way you could call it stay in your mm-hmm. lane or, or whatnot about my medical advice. And so... And I think as doctors, we, we, we are kind of bound by this oath also to, you know, do no harm and to always kind of uh, do what's best for a patient. And right. part of that is being very truthful about what we're talking about and, and talking about evidence-based medicine and things that we know have worked and for years and years. And we have data that backs it up. We have right. scientific studies uh, that back all uh, the treatment. Rec- when I make a treatment recommendation, and I know you do the same thing, Eric, mm-hmm. about your surgeries and what are recommending when we send people to physical therapy, our patients to physical therapy, it's because there's evidence behind our treatment recommendations, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so uh, the, the crazy thing about the internet and kind of social media is that you don't need to necessarily, you, anyone can say anything and say, you know, I recommend this, you know, this uh, herb mm-hmm. and uh, this thing will possibly cure cancer. And right. And if people are saying that on the internet, you know, people kind of, uh, patients can buy into that and there's no, uh, there's no regulation, just like you said about that. And mm-hmm. so I think that uh, this Verify Healthcare campaign, if you actually go on Instagram and you search that hashtag, Verify Healthcare, you'll notice a lot of doctors, and not just doctors, we're trying to get nurses, dentists, uh, all PAs, med, PAs students, med students, all types of pre-meds, healthcare. Pre-meds, anybody, because exactly. everybody, everybody has a perspective. And yeah. And what we're trying to encourage is, uh, transparency online for, you know, not just Instagram, but social media in general. We, we want people to be very transparent about their backgrounds and about their credentials and what training they've had so that uh, patients, if they're going to take that advice and, you know, look at that post and say, oh, well, Dr. Andrew is recommending this type of uh, physical uh physical therapy video or mm-hmm. whatnot. Well, we know that what's you have a the, background. What's, what's the context? Exactly. Yeah. What's the context where yeah. that's coming from? And that's so important. So the in, in the interest of uh, transparency and honesty, we are talking about back pain today. So any of you that have questions on back pain, feel free to call in. That's 877-NYU-DOCS. That's 877-698-3627. Or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. I'm speaking to Daniel Choi. My name is Dr. Eric Ander, Chief of Neurosurgeon at NYU Langone Hospital, Brooklyn, and a spine surgeon. So we're going to go to some calls. Uh, I'm going to talk to Art in Florida. Art, how's it going? Hey, doctor. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Good morning. So I have a uh, uh, herniated uh, degenerative disc in my lumbar uh, three and four. Uh, I went to my uh, neurosurgeon and uh, they recommended me to do a X-lift procedure where they remove the disc and they put in, I guess, it's something else in there. So an, uh, an X-lift, what? yeah, an X-lift procedure for those out there is um, one type of um, complete discectomy. So you remove the entire disc um, and fusion operation. And one of the ways that it differs from the traditional fusion where we go through the back is that um, it's a technique where you can just put a small little, you know, scope or something in someone's side. So you have them laying on their side, and you essentially just kind of push the the uh, the muscles surrounding the spine out of the way, and park a little, um, you know, a little, not a camera, but basically a, a dilator right over there. And then it gives you a nice little window to say, to see the disc and remove it. 
Um, so I wanted to get back to the, the symptoms you've been having. Is it all back pain or is it leg pain too? Uh, there's uh, uh, the leg pain, the nerve, uh, the nerve going down the inside of my right, my right thigh. Um, the nerve is pressing down. I guess that they, we, I did a uh, an X-ray and an MRI, and they can clearly see that that between those two, uh, well, the, the disc is really bad shape. Well, I'm I'm less concerned with the MR, what the MRI shows, and more concerned with what you're feeling. So, what is it? What is the what does the pain feel like, and where is it exactly? The pain is a sharp pain in the back, in that in that lower area, and uh, I I did I I have gotten. Um, epidural shot to, to try to numb the pain, the nerve pain. I do get nerve pain uh, coming down the, the thigh, inside of the thigh. So, but on the right, on the, now, on the right uh, side? On the right side? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and they're telling you, did they offer you a discectomy? A, tr a traditional discectomy? Uh, the, they recommended this x lift uh, procedure. I don't know if the, this, uh, it's a similar, I guess, is that similar to a discectomy? It's a little bit different because it's not, you know, it doesn't involve the fusion. So, um, uh, so there's a couple, a couple things here. So basically if, um, if they're advocating a fusion, um, you should ask them what the reason for the fusion is. Um, only because uh, it used to be that people were pretty liberal with, the, with what, what they did fusions for. So they did it for disc herniations, bulging, degenerative disc disease, all the way up to and including things like fractures and real instability and infections and cancer. And we're sort of finding that fusions for just disc problems probably, probably is not the way to go. Um, now, that's a blanket statement, um, and I, I would have to know more about the specifics about what's going on with you um, <coughs> in order to make a real assessment of that. But I would just say as a general rule, fusions are usually um, they're limited to people that have demonstrated instability. So there's some kind of uh, movement, actually abnormal movement in the spine, which you would sometimes see on an x-ray where you're bending forward and backwards. Um, or some other some other reason. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not typically done just for a disc problem. Now, uh, it, I think what they may be worried about is the fact that you're having a lot of back pain associated with mm -hmm. this, which could be part of the reason for doing it. Um, but the bottom line is, what you really want to have done is you want to make sure your nerve is decompressed. And mm -hmm. all you have to really do is, I think, get out of the surgeon what the specific reasons are for why the fusion should be done and why doing that particular approach as opposed to a traditional discectomy is a way to go. I don't know, what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on this, Dan? You know, uh, Art, I think that, um, you know, w if, if you were in my clinic and uh, you came in and said, you know, I have leg pain, you know, I actually, uh, when I have patients that come in with leg pain, that's actually a uh, symptom that, uh, that I feel I can treat as a spine surgeon very effectively. Uh, back pain is a little tougher. Um, it, it's not that you can't treat that with uh, spine surgery, but it's just not as reliable. And if you really think about the pathophysiology of back pain and sciatica, why Eric here, uh, why Dr. Andrew was here was talking about nerve decompression. When someone has pain shooting down the leg, if you decompress the nerve that's compress compress compressing the nerve that's causing that leg pain, you should reliably, and there's no guarantees with any kind of surgery or you know, any medicine really, but uh, right. you know, if right. you decompress the nerve, that leg pain uh, will have relief. Back pain is tricky because you can get back pain from that disc maybe that's degenerated, or it can come from other discs that might be worn out in your back. Uh, it can come from you know, muscle spasms. It can come from the facet joints. You have joints actually in your back, just like we have an elbow joint or a hip joint. Uh, so uh, yeah. it's tricky. If you fuse at one level, are we really going to take care of your back pain it's hard to say and yeah. so that's why you know i know dr andrew was mentioning that might be the concern and so when patients come in and they say i have back pain 50 percent back pain 50 percent leg pain some surgeons are inclined to offer a fusion uh but i you know when my patients come to my clinic i'm i'm pretty upfront that uh the the fusion if i do offer a fusion uh, that this may not 100% um, reliably take care of the back pain. So this too. this would be an instance I think where it's good to be um, informed, right? I mean, just just make sure that you have a real discussion with your with your surgeon about why it is specifically they think um, a fusion operation is the way to go as opposed to a traditional discectomy. And I think uh, and, and as as long as the answer that you get makes sense to you, um, I would say that's you know it's it's a reasonable plan. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, I, everyone is sort of different in terms of how they approach this. Um, I wanted to go to, uh, to Pennsylvania. We're going to speak to Eleanor about, I think, PRP, right? Hi. I, I was wondering about the efficacy of uh, PR uh, protein-rich plasma and also stem cells for pain control in the back. So um, it's good that I have an orthopedic surgeon here with mm -hmm. me um, who they're really well versed in PRP, um, more so than, than, than the neurosurgeons are, <laughs> I think. Um, what are your thoughts on PRP and whether or not that has any impact on back pain? Sure, absolutely. So I think that for back pain, um, for back pain necessarily and degenerative discs, PRP is, is a little bit, uh, it hasn't really been uh, studied uh, to the point that I would be comfortable with. And so I'm not someone who really pushes it in my clinic or offers it, to be honest. And I know that there's, you know, I've looked, looked up some of the studies uh, that have been done on PRP. You know, they have two-year follow-up, uh, pretty small numbers. Uh, now I'm talking a little bit of shop for, you know, the, the, you know when, as, a, as, a, as a doctor, we're scientists first, to be honest. We're trained as scientists. We're, we learn to interpret studies. And uh, when you look at a study, you look at the quality of, uh, a number of people that have been studied. You look at how long they've been studied for, and then you look at how they measure the results. And uh, I think that the studies out there for back pain and degenerative discs are just not strong enough for me to comfortably push it. Now, can I say that it? it I can't also say it doesn't work. Um, I just don't. We just don't know enough. I think at yeah. this point to really make a firm I, to take a firm stance. And on this. Uh, Eleanor, I'm also curious. Um, so where, your back pain is low back. Uh, cervical. Where is it? Cervical and low. Low back. Okay. And has, has have you been evaluated by somebody with uh, an MRI or anything like that up until now? Like, and what other kinds of treatments have you done? Oh well, I'm in physical therapy now, mm -hmm. and I use. I just had a MRI done last night. Okay. I guess I'm just wondering why it is that they're talking to you about PRP right away. I mean, that's not a first line treatment for either back or neck pain necessarily. Yeah. Well, my orthopedic uh, apparently went to med school with someone who does it. Gotcha. And, uh, uh, and, and also stem cell. Okay. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, it, it's, as, as Dan said, I mean, it's just, th th these things haven't been fully tested yet. Um, uh, and so I would probably at this point maybe stick with something a little more traditional to begin with um, and see how that works. That being said, I've seen all kinds of crazy things work for back pain. So, sure. um, and things that we formerly thought were crazy. Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, like if you told somebody to do yoga or acupuncture, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, <laughs> as, a, as a, you know, Western medicine, you know, surgeon, they would have looked at right. you like you had two heads. Um, but the thing is, that's what I'm telling 90% of my patients to do now. So, um, so I'm not necessarily saying because it's a new technology not to, not, not to engage in it. What I'm saying is that, I would probably go with some more traditional non-invasive techniques first, things like the physical therapy and all, um, before I jump right into PRP, um, particularly if, you know, you haven't really done a whole lot of other, other treatments as of yet. So, uh, you know, I do Tai Chi, I do yoga. Good, 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 good. No, I, I, would de I would definitely do all that. And then again, just talk to your uh, talk to your doctor about what the specific reasons are. And then look, I mean, it's not, um, it isn't confrontational to ask a physician why, why um, should I get this treatment? What are the complication rates and complications associated with it? And is there really evidence to support its use? Any physician that can't answer that mm -hmm. or uh, that brushes that off is not somebody that you should be uh, treated by, um, in, my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go over to, uh, to California. Um, we're going to speak to Shelly over in the left coast. How's it going? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. Of course. Good morning. My mother, my 90-year-old my mother fell two weeks ago and has a compression fracture of her L1. Mm -hmm. She was put into, I think it's a, I can't remember the name of the brace, but it has a big butterfly plastic piece that kind of comes up the front of her chest. Yeah, it kind of looks so. like a like a, like a Roman armor or something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like a torture <laughs> device. Yeah, and, um, that, that's a, yeah, probably a more honest way of putting it. <laughs> pretty accurate. <laughs> We're not, um, we can't, they referred her in the ER to a neurosurgeon. I don't think she's a surgical candidate for anything. And we can't get in to see him for another month. Is mm -hmm. this just going to heal on its own? She's not in a lot of pain. Um, Tylenol pretty much takes care of her pain. Her local PCP recommended to start her on a 4% lidocaine patch. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I need no like no leg pain, right? No, no le leg pain. Um, she's, she's not that strong of a walker. She uses a walker um, to get around. She lives in a living um, a assisted living facility. So okay. I mean, is it just you know, heal? You think it'll just heal without any in further intervention? Well, um, so there's a, a couple things. Uh, I definitely agree with you. It doesn't sound like your mom's a surgical candidate, and I don't think she should be evaluated for surgery um, based purely on what you're saying. Um, I think the, especially given the fact that she's not having a whole lot of pain, um, that's a good sign. Uh, and also, not being able to see somebody for a month, um, you know, for this, if you've already, if she, if she's already been evaluated in the emergency room. Uh, and and discharge with a brace on. She's at least protected until until she sees somebody. And uh, I don't necessarily see a reason to have her evaluated immediately because it's actually going to take a long time for this to heal, given the fact that she's ninety um, and her bones are just going to take you know that much longer to fuse. Right, Dan? Mm -hmm. I mean, what yeah, what will be your? Just recently, she recently had a DEXA exam and she yeah. only has mild osteopenia. So oh, good, that's excellent. Good. That's good. Excellent. Thank what you. Are, what are your so, thoughts um, on this, Dan? Because this is something we, we see this fairly often. Um, sorry, go ahead. You had another question? No, I'm just listening. Yeah, yeah. So, Dan, what, do, what are your thoughts on compression fractures? Yeah, uh, compression fractures, if I see a patient uh, in the hospital, usually I, the, the emergency room will call me for a consult, you know, a geriatric patient with a compression fracture. Uh, typically, I'll see them. I'll examine them. I'll look at the... Uh, imaging, um, and for the most part, compression fracture treatment is non-surgical. Um, there used to be a trend of a, a procedure called a kyphoplasty, um, where uh, you inject cement into a um, the vertebral body, which is fractured. Uh, that had that that trend has really kind of died down, and uh, much of that has to do with lots of um, high, high, um, big big studies that showed that. It wasn't really effective in, you know, treating compression fracture. You can get away. You can uh, really just do non-surgical treatment and still have the same result. Um, and so, and really, for chronic ones, right? For chronic like, ones, people were yeah. doing it for all kinds of reasons. They were right away, you like, take yeah, a yeah. patient who fell, and then they go from the ER right to the operating room to get a kyphoplasty. And uh, and when they really studied it, um, it looked like it wasn't having a significant benefit for these acute fractures. And so uh, typically, uh, when I see these patients at the ER, I will uh, just say, I'll look at the imaging, obviously, I'll look it over, because you know at the end of the day, uh, I still my recommendation is still to kind of be evaluated in person by a specialist and by a, by a physician. I wouldn't, uh, you know, Dr. Andrew and I, you know, we've trained a lot, and, and we're giving this, you know, advice, but at the end of the day, my, my first advice is still always Ways to get seen by a medical professional uh, as soon as possible. I understand your predicament here that you, you can't be seen uh, you, by the neurosurgeon, uh, and uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, I think that if I see a patient in the ER, then I'm going to be telling them, you know, you're going to see me in my clinic in about four to six weeks, and I'll get a repeat X-ray. And the reason mm -hmm. why I do that is just to make sure that the compression fracture hasn't worsened uh, right. in, deform in, in its deformity. And uh, what I and usually you don't even have to get the X-ray to know that the fracture has worsened. Actually, you people can, get pain. The, pa the patient yeah. will tell me the pain yeah. got worse, yeah. and then I can just predict when I get the X-ray that the fracture's gotten worse at that point. But so the, bas the basic time course for this is you're going to get an x-ray or, or mm -hmm. a cat scan or some kind of uh something to basically take a look at the fracture probably once a month for about three months and exactly. after, after about three months you usually take the brace off exactly um so i'm going to go to maryland and uh speak to barbara barbara good morning uh welcome to dr radio hi um i have a very good friend mm -hmm. who had an accident about five years ago and they did a surgery on him where they fused the lumbar vertebrae okay and ever since, this, ever since the surgery, his pain has been much worse. It's excruciating. He can't walk without a walker, and his head is forced forward. He can't straighten it. So recently, he saw an orthopedic surgeon that said that in the initial surgery, they didn't leave room for the natural curvature of the spine. So he, he had lumbar surgery and now has curvature of the neck, is what you're saying, right? Um, well, curvature all over, really. Okay. The, the, the whole spine and the neck. Okay. And now they're suggesting um, to fuse the neck first, and then a couple of weeks later, redo the lumbar fusion. 
um, and remove part of, I think, part of the vertebrae or whatever, so that his head is going to be centered over the pelvis. Okay. Uh, how old? How old? How old is he? Sixty-seven. Yeah. Um, this is a this is a tough one because um, this is something that's it's so individualized. I mean, you'd really have to. I'd have to see him, see his MRIs, see his uh, his X-rays, and really examine him because the the question of curvature is something that uh, that actually I mean should have been considered for as long as we were doing fusions, but I think probably hasn't been considered as strongly as it should have been. Um, and what I mean by that is that when you fuse somebody's vertebra, you're basically making it immobile, and the spine is naturally mobile. So one of the problems that people started to realize, and this ha this is goes back to just, you know, even treating scoliosis with Harrington rods, you know, those mm -hmm. old-style yeah. rods, is that they used to basically fuse people and not move, and it wouldn't make, so their spine wouldn't move, and that's fine. So they'd go, uh, you know, the, the pain would immediately get better, but then they'd end up running into problems later on because their spine was basically ramrod straight. Um, and then they develop, you know, breakdown above that level, below that level. So spine surgeons are really into this concept of adjacent segment disease, yep. which basically just means breakdown at the level above or below where you made the spine immobile, where you fused it. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, there's a further concept of when you fuse somebody, you need to fuse them in an anatomically correct position. So when you have a natural curvature of the spine, you want to restore that natural curvature, not just fuse it. So that's kind of like the backdrop for, you know, all the questions about um, this specific case, Barbara. Um, but it's a, it's a very complicated one. And, uh, you know, given that a lot of these surgeries end up being really, really long, big surgeries, where in some cases, I mean, as unappetizing as it sounds, I mean, what you're really doing is you're fracturing the spine and mm -hmm. putting it back into another position. Um, right, exactly. And mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing. So this is something that I would think really hard about um, before and uh, going into. I mean, nothing that you said sounds crazy, um, but it's, a, it's such an individualized thing with such a big surgery that um, he, your friend has to really think about this. I mean, wh what are your thoughts on this, Dan? Like, and you see this, you see this too, right? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, patients who've had prior fusions, um, in the past who come to me and they, you know, th there's, there's also not just fusions is uh, a patient who's had a decompression in the past. Uh, there's something called post laminectomy syndrome where they, you you basically destabilize the spine, uh, by removing the bone from the posterior aspect of it. And what ends up happening is the, the, if you look at the lower back, if you look at anyone's lower back, it's curved, uh, like a C. And what happens is that uh, the C kind of straightens out and all of a sudden the patient's falling forward and they have what we call flat back syndrome. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately what happens is now the global alignment of the patient's uh, head to the pelvis is off and the head is tilted forward and patients are working really hard. Their muscles are working hard to try to you know, get their head back into the position that it's supposed to be in to look, to look level. And that puts a lot of undue stress on on the patient as it's well. a it's a really tough concept sometimes to explain too mm -hmm. but it's the reason why you see a lot of people hunched over eyes to the ground bent, bent forward yep. with their hips tucked and all this it's a very it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem um so we're gonna hold for now and take a quick break uh, i wanted to remind you uh that we're uh, on the back pain special here so any questions that you have regarding back pain we're actually talking surgery now um i'm dr eric ander the chief of nurse at the nyu langone brooklyn talking to daniel Choi who is an orthopedic spine surgeon. We're talking all things spine surgery. So feel free to call in. Uh, that's 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627. Or you can email your questions at docs at SiriusXM.com. We'll be back. Never miss a beat of Dr. Radio with the Sirius XM app. Dr. Radio. Hear it everywhere with an online subscription. Go to SiriusXM.com to learn more. Hi from NYU Langone. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Anderer. All right, everybody. 
Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Radio Back Pain Special on Sirius XM Channel 110. We're live from NYU Langone. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Anderer. I'm the Chief of Neurosurgery at NYU Langone Hospital, Brooklyn, and I'm a spine surgeon here. And I'm talking to Dr. Daniel Choi, who's an orthopedic spine surgeon at Long Island Spine Specialist and a fellowship-trained surgeon with a specialty focus in minimally invasive spine surgery. So we're taking a lot of calls, so feel free to call in. Um, anything about back surgery, back pain, sciatica, disc problems, whatever, give us a call. That's 877-NYU-DOCS. That's 877-698-3627. Or you can email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. So um, I wanted to just touch on one thing before we start taking some calls. I mean, a lot of people, and people ask me this all the time, they come in, they're like, okay, I have a back problem. I was told to go to an orthopedic surgeon because it's a bone problem, so I don't know why I'm here, neurosurgeon. Or the opposite, where people are like, oh, it's a nerve problem because it's sciatica, so I have to be going to a neurosurgeon, not an orthopedic surgeon. Um, can you talk, Dan, a little bit about, like, I mean, and because you're a little bit closer to training. Um, sure you know, how the training works now, um, you know, and, and, you know, cause it, a lot of, a lot of people now, I think, um, the way they view this is spine is almost like one specialty, right? I, I mean, agree with you. Is it orthopedic or neurosurgeon? It kind of doesn't matter, right? I, I think that there's equal number of neurosurgeons and orthopedists doing great, uh, quality surgery across the country. Um, and a uh, training is really cross pollinated. So I know that uh, neurosurgeons, you guys are working uh, the brain on the brain and also the spine, and you guys your um, residency is kind of divided up, you know, evenly th uh, with spine and brain. Orthopedic surgery, we have a lot of different subspecialties. We have hand, uh, foot, and ankle joints, but uh, a, a big subspecialty that we also uh, get trained in is spine. And then uh, there's spine specific fellowships that after a neurosurgical residency or orthopedic residency that uh, we get trained in all the procedures of the spine. I actually, uh, actually, I, I know uh, Dr. Ander here, he did an orthopedic spine surgery fellowship after his neurosurgical training. I actually did a combined orthopedic and neurosurgical uh, uh, spine fellowship over at Harvard Med School. And uh, my attendings who I trained under were both orthopedic surgeons and also neurosurgeons doing the exact same procedures. And it's, it's interesting because it, it's traditionally been, uh, you know, sort of the purview of the orthopedic surgeons if you're talking about something like a bone problem or, um, you know, something like scoliosis. Um, I think that was sort of like the last frontier for neurosurgeons. Um, and neurosurgeons were the ones that did most of like, you know, the, sort of the, the intricate decompressions around nerve roots and, you know, cord, the spinal cord and all that. Um, but it really has gotten to a point with, uh, you know, the cross pollination of ideas and the sort of the parallel training that as long as you're going to somebody that um, has some kind of specialized interest in spine, that's either a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon, um, you're, you're pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Just make sure that that's what that's what they do. And that's primarily what they treat. And I think as a patient, I think you're in good hands. Absolutely. So um, I wanted to start with some calls because uh, we have a lot of them um, and I want to make sure we get to as many as possible. So I'm going to. Um, go to Illinois and speak to Linda about her daughter. Linda, good morning. Welcome to Dr. Radio. How's it going? Um, it's going pretty good. All right. What's um, going on? How can we help? Uh, well, I'll try to keep it short. It's pretty complicated. My daughter had neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain over years. Are you still there? Yes. Okay. And she had surgeries for this, surgeries for that. Well, they finally, three years ago, diagnosed her with a carry malformation. Okay. And she had a sudden escalation of symptoms. They did emergency decompression surgery on her. Now, it's helped a lot of things, but she has chronic, terrible muscle spasms in the left side of her neck. Yeah. And she's been to pain clinics. She's done this. She's done that. Nothing's helped. When was the surgery? Except, I'm sorry? When was the surgery? Three years ago. And she's still having neck pain? Oh, they're terrible. She's gotten to where she's... she's She's afraid to move her head, I think. Her muscles are so stiff and tight from yeah. being afraid to trigger a spasm. She just had Botox shots in her neck a couple of days ago. This is the second round to see if that helps. But I'm just wondering, is there any way to tell if this is permanent? She had a sear that went down the spine 
probably yeah. seven centimeters. So this is this, this, no, no. And this this is a very difficult um, problem, um, and almost runs into as much of a brain issue as it does a spine issue. Um, I'll just quickly recap. I mean, a, a Chiari malformation is um, for those of you out there that don't know what it is. It's basically a problem with low lying. Your, the back of your brain is essentially low lying. So you imagine your your brain stem kind of comes out and becomes your spinal cord as it exits your skull, the base of your skull, and goes down your back. Um, with the Chiari malformation, what ends up happening is you also have some brain contents which sort of um, start to try to come out the base of your skull as well. So they herniate out or kind of squish out the bottom of your brain, of, of your skull. And what ends up happening with that is that it crowds the brain stem and causes lots of problems. Um, so people can get balance difficulty, they can get pain, they can get uh, a typical complaint would be what we call tussive headaches or headaches that happen with coughing. Um, but whatever the reason, it's usually a problem with increased pressure right around the base of your brain. The way it's treated is you essentially decompress the area, but to do that, um, you're taking off bone, you're actually disturbing a lot of the normal muscles that attach to your, uh, you know, your, your upper cervical spine and the base of your skull. That has issues only because, you know, because it's, um, a lot of that is responsible for the stability of your upper neck and the back of your head. So it is not uncommon for people to have that kind of spasm and pain continue for quite some time, and it can be a problem. Um, you know, I, I think I heard, I, I saw that you had tried, that you had tried Botox, um, which is definitely something to do. Um, Really, the best thing to do, and this is going to be a long-term course, honestly, and I know a surgery was three years ago, but it's really going to be um, a protracted course of um, of strengthening those paraspinal and core muscles um, through things like physical therapy, but also other core strengthening activities. I would actually say something like Pilates would be very good for this. Swimming is good for this. A lot of the sort of passive range of motion initially, but then activation of those muscles. But this is going to be a long haul um, and complicated, so I really hope she ends up doing well in the long run. Um, I'm going to, uh, and thank you for the call. I'm going to go over to Colorado and speak to Scott. Uh, Scott, how's it going? Welcome to Dr. Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. How's it going? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, I was involved in a car accident in October where my family and I were hit by a, um, a stone driver here in Colorado. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. And it, what it did was it caused an L5, S1, 4 millimeter um, bulge and, um, in my disc down there, causing um, mild S1 nerve impingement. Okay. Do you have do you have leg pain? And well, what it, it did for a while, it took about three months for the symptoms to arise. And um, I'm a trail runner out here, and I was finding that um, I was having a hard time stepping off my foot, getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. It felt like there was a tight shoe wrapped around my right foot, mm -hmm. and everything is increasing. Um, as far as um, curing, I'm doing great. I've got a great chiropractor. I'm doing physical therapy. But the main issue is that I'm, they're discovering that it's the piriformis muscle in my right buttock, which is always aggravated and, and really ticked off. What it, does the L5-S1 issue cause, the piriformis issue in my buttocks and leg? No. Or piriformis syndrome? You, or is it something no, I think they're, they're separate. And a lot of times you end up diagnosing piriformis syndrome. And, and for those out there um, that are listening, the piriformis is a small muscle mm -hmm. um, in basically in, in the middle of your butt. So if you imagine the sciatic nerve, it kind of comes out. It's mm -hmm. a, a, um, a conglomeration of nerves that come out of your, your spine. They kind of center into this big and form this large nerve that goes down your butt, the sciatic nerve. And the piriformis is a muscle that sits in like the butt notch, basically, mm -hmm. where that sciatic nerve comes out. And, and from inflammation or spasm or what have you, that can actually cause pressure on the sciatic nerve, and it can be an extra source of pain. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes diagnose uh, it um, in the course of looking at somebody with sciatica that doesn't have a clear explanation for sciatic pain otherwise. So in other words, if somebody doesn't have um, a disc herniation on an MRI, we'll start thinking about something like piriformis. Now, it's not to say that they can't both be present, um, mm -hmm. because it is possible, um, but I'd say it's much more likely that it's one or the other. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I was just sort of curious as to, how did you get that diagnosis? It was a, a physical therapist or somebody who had looked um, looked at you and, it, and looked at your piriformis, um, in the, or, did, or is that, um, like how, how did you get diagnosed with that? Yes, sir, I visited a reputable uh, orthopedic clinic up in Vail, Colorado. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And uh, they 
did the, the imaging up there and physical therapists were great and they actually suggested doing an epidural and then doing a disectomy <laughs> right away and I said let's hold off on that let's let's get uh, some PT going here yeah. and the PT worked great and the guy uh, was able to get my strength back in my leg and I've been able to keep up my mileage of about Good. 70 miles a week with running so this is the reason this is yeah it. This is the reason why we don't go right to surgery, right, Dan? Absolutely I mean, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely not. I, I, I think that, you know, that, that was the right move there in terms of doing physical therapy. Uh, you know, I, I think a minimum of at least six weeks of physical therapy uh, to uh, see if that pain gets better is uh, usually, usually pretty standard. Um, and obviously uh, there's, you know, there's other uh, symptoms, you know, I, that may make surgery more urgent, such as if you have weakness in your legs or bowel or bladder symptoms. But if it's just pain, I tell my patients that, you know, the spine surgery is elective. And that means that, you know, it's, it's not emergent. You don't have to do it right away for any reason, especially if it's just pain. Um, and physical therapy usually is the, is the go-to answer right away. Also, uh, other uh, non-surgical interventions like acupuncture, yoga, chiropractic treatments, all these things uh, can play a role in, you know, helping a patient recover. Uh, from sciatica, from a disc herniation. All right, so to re remind you all out there listening, this is the Dr. Radio Back Pain Special. Dr. Eric Ander here. I'm talking to Dr. Daniel Choi. Uh, we're talking all things spine and spine surgery, so feel free to call in. Uh, that's 877-698-3627, NYU Docs. Um, so I'd like to go over to Missouri. We're going to talk Missouri or Missouri. What's what, what do you... Missouri, I usually say. <laughs> I, don't know, I think people from out yeah. east say Missouri, but Missouri. Uh, Missouri. All right, Tom, we're going to speak to Tom about uh, the back surgery he had about a year ago. Correct. Um, I went through physical therapy and the whole bit and finally decided that uh, disc therapy was the only thing left for the lower part of my back. Uh, I am kyphotic, which means that the upper part of my back also is very painful. Mm -hmm. all, almost all the time, and full of full of uh, arthritis. And so, kyphosis for the, for the listeners is when the the when you're sort of hunched forward. Um, so it's an abnormal positioning of the spine where you're hunched forward. Go ahead, Tom. Um, and I had what I had was a cadaver bone with stem cell and, and injections. Mm -hmm. um, and it his track record is very good. It's over ninety percent. But my wife has Parkinson's, so I had to help her in and out of bed and so forth. And so I think I undid all of the good that was done with the, with the surgery. So mm -hmm. I'm now with my sixth set of pain relief doctors. I have had injections on the left side, and I don't remember the name of the um, injection. But uh, I had it on the left side, and I'm having it on the right side later this month. So t Tom, can I can I ask you where where are you, where are your symptoms exactly? Where is the pain? Lower back as well as uh, neck and shoulder. So low back, neck and shoulder. All right. Do you have any pain, um, like electrical or burning type pain down your arms or legs? Um, leg occasionally, but not not really burning. It's just uh, walking and standing are almost impossible for me. And is it that you feel bent, hunched over, and you get pain that gets worse throughout the day? Or is it pain that gets worse with a specific activity? A specific activity, standing and walking. Mm. Okay. Those are the two that, and also, if I have to do any leaning over types of activities, like uh, helping my wife get her feet in bed and so forth, you know, those kind of things really make my back hurt that day. Tom, when you had the back surgery one year ago, did you have hardware placed? Did they put screws and rods? Do you know if that no, happened? No, just cadaver bone with uh, my stem cell injections. Okay, so there was no metal placed into your into your back. None. Okay. Um, but they told you it was a fusion, right? I did. And where in the cervical spine, the neck spine, or the lumbar, or the lower back spine? Uh, L two three four and S or um, so lumbar, lumbar lumbar look lower lower back yeah. right yeah okay maybe yeah. insight two fusion right um, okay so um, so yeah so I think that um, there's a couple of issues here obviously one of the problems is that um, people that have uh, neck and back pain alone 
um, oftentimes are poor candidates for surgery unless there is something very, very specific we're, we're, we're finding here. So something like kyphosis could be, so like a mm -hmm. scoliosis type of thing that's happening that we think is causing the pain, although that was what I was getting at with the questions about the pain getting worse throughout the day. People that have scoliosis or a deformity, like poor positioning of the mm -hmm. spine related pain, typically have pain that gets worse throughout the day. It's usually not the type of pain that is um, v uh, attached to a specific activity, although it can be. Um, the, but neck and back pain in and of itself is some is, uh, are, are entities that are difficult to treat with surgery unless you have something very specific, fracture, instability, um, so a demonstrated instability on the spine, on a, on a moving x-ray film, or um, an infection, or a tumor, or um, thing, things like that. Um, now, that being said, um, it, it may be that there is a surgical option for you, but I think that um, by and large, what, what I'm hearing is probably something that is more appropriate for a global kind of core strengthening, um, you know, treatment regimen uh, and probably non-surgical. Um, although, again, it's going to be hard to say that without really looking at your films. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts, Dan? You know, I think when a patient comes into my clinic with prior back surgery, uh, I ask that question, do you have metal in your back or do you have hardware? Uh, it, it, especially, it sounds like they tried to do some type of fusion. You're saying they use cadaver bone and stem cells. They probably, uh, I'm conjecturing it's probably an in situ fusion, which is, you know, a fusion without screws and rods placed. And it, when a patient comes to me with a prior fusion done, one thing that I do think about in my workup is something called a pseudoarthrosis. So uh, the name of the game with a fusion surgery is that you are trying to allow your body to form bone in the areas that they're packing that cadaver bone in or putting the screws and rods in, we want your, it's like an internal splint we're forming really with the screws and rods for your own body to heal and lay down bone in those areas. And when that happens, theoretically, uh, we're hoping that that stabilizes your back and helps improve some of your back pain. And so if you had this fusion and you're having persistent back pain, one of the things I would think about is a pseudoarthrosis and so i do think it is which worth means that the bones didn't fuse exactly <coughs> didn't that there fuse. was there was yeah. a failure of fusion exactly yeah. that the bone did not lay down the way that it was supposed to uh, and that can happen even with hardware being placed as well and that is something i do think about in my workup and uh, you know you can get special studies to try to look for that so it is it may be worthwhile to at least seek an opinion from uh, a, a surgeon uh, to see what they think after your fusion in my opinion um Thank you for the call, Tom. Uh, I wanted to go to Massachusetts and speak to Lori. Lori, how's it going? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Absolutely, good. Thanks for, thanks for being on Dr. Radio. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking my call, too. Um, I am 60 years old. I'm very active. I work out. I um, stay very active. And I have problems with discs, L4, L5, S1, with some spondylolisthesis as well that's developed over the last several years. And my back pain is basically caused from activity. So if I work out, if I lift weights, um, if I walk too far up hills, whatever. And if I just stop the activity, my back pain goes away. So I want to know if that's normal. Do you get leg pain? I used to have, I had leg pain way back when probably about 10 years ago. And I had some um, sciatica pain, mm -hmm. but I have not had any leg pain for a very long time. Yeah, so um, one of the, I did want to address one of the things you brought up. So spondylolisthesis. Um, spondylolisthesis is basically an instability. That was one of the things I was referring to earlier when we were talking about fusion. Um, it basically okay. means that, uh, and this is more for the listeners. I'm assuming, Lori, you might have had this explained to you already. Um, but, uh, yeah. but basically um, what it is is it's an instability at one level of the spine. And so the, the, okay. you know, the spine is supposed to be a, a nice curve, nice gentle curve. You'll have one level. Um, where the bone at, uh, is either too much, too far in front or too far behind the one below it. Um, and so oftentimes what people will do and what we'll do is we'll get x-rays. We want to see if, the, if there is movement there, abnormal movement. But that is something, so okay. we're, the implication is that that's an abnormal joint. Mm -hmm. So that, um, okay. that can be um, a pain generator. That, could be, that can be part of the cause of the pain. Although the good thing is okay. you, don't have, you don't have pain on a normal basis, right? It's really only when you exercise. No. Only when I exercise, or like, like it, it, daily activity, like uh, putting uh, clothes into the to the the, the dryer or something mm -hmm. like that, that causes pain. You know, yeah. I just get that like 
And are you do, are you doing any are you doing any kind of specific um, physical therapy or other kind of non surgical treatment regimen? Well, to be honest with you, I, over like the last ten years, I think I've tried everything I can possibly do up and up till to like even like cortisone injections and mm -hmm. you know basically nothing really has seemed to do the job. And are you um, are, are you currently active still, or are you not? Yes, I work out every day. Mm -hmm. I lift weights. I do Pilates. I do everything I should be doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I so do it with pain. I mean, I, I just work mm -hmm. through it because you know, if I do it or I don't do it, it's still mm -hmm. going to bother me. So. Yep. So th this is a tough one because uh, you know you actually are going through a lot of the things I think that um, that you should be doing um, before doing something more uh -huh. invasive like an injection. But it sounds to me uh -huh. like you might need to do one um, and I, th I say that only because what you want to do is you want to kind of at least reduce inflammation reduce pain to the extent that you can really reap the benefits of what it is you're doing on the outside in terms of the core strength and general body health um, because I think okay. a lot of times what ends up happening is um, people end up not doing not getting as much out of their you know their physical therapy their Pilates their yoga mm -hmm. their swimming as they would otherwise had they not been in pain. I mean, what would you be your advice, Dan, to, uh, to, to Lori in this case? Uh, Lori, first of all, I'm very impressed you know the word spondylolisthesis yeah, because <laughs> I could barely say it myself uh, as a spine surgeon. Uh, that's, that's impressive. Uh, but, um, you know, this is a really tough situation. You know, I think that you're doing all the right things. Like Dr. Ander said here, you're, you're really going out there and staying active and uh, really acting like there's really nothing wrong with your back and really um, getting yourself out there. And, and so I agree with him that you should continue doing that uh, and try to figure out ways to maximize uh, those activities. Um, in terms of whether you're, you know, I think the, the question is, you know, do you want to take that jump to get a surgery, essentially? And you're probably playing with that idea in your head a little bit. And it's really, for me, if you came to my clinic, you know, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't be someone who could tell you, like, hey, you got to sign up for surgery. It's going to definitely help you. And I don't think many spine surgeons would say that. Again, about back pain, it's it's tough. Uh, if you came to my clinic and you had debilitating leg pain and you had a lot of sciatica, um, and uh, you know your imaging showed you know something that correlated with that leg pain, then you know surgery could more reliably uh, help your leg pain. But back mm -hmm. pain again, it's it's what I would tell my patients is that really this is a last resort option. Um, you know, if you right. if you right. if you can't handle it and you can't do the activities that you love and your lifestyle is very adversely affected, it may be something to consider at that point. So thank you so much, Lori, for the call. Um, I wanted to because we're sort of wrapping up here. I wanted to ask Dan. Um, just some bullet points for people out there. Like, what would you tell people that they that are red flags that they should see a surgeon for? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that red flags. Um, there's there's uh, you know a lot of them, and you know if 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 you have back pain that is increasing, let's say for example, and it's not getting better with physical therapy, uh, that's that's. Uh, you know, and over, you know, over weeks or, you know, three, four or five weeks and your back pain is getting to the point you can't um, tolerate it, you definitely need to be evaluated. Uh, some of the things, what I tell my patients in my clinic is that, look, uh, everything in your body will grow back. So muscles, bones, hair grows back. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, uh, what happens is that uh, with nerves, if you have any kind of neurologic uh, problem, that's a, 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 a time when you really have to get evaluated by a surgeon. So weakness, right. bowel and bladder symptoms. Pain down the leg, exactly. pain, pain in the arms, that kind of thing. Exactly. So I, I wish we could talk all day, but unfortunately we can't. Um, so I wanted to thank all of you for tuning in. And I want to thank my guests. Uh, and if, if you guys missed any part of the show and you want to tune in and listen to it, you can stream it or even download shows for offline listening. Go to SiriusXM.com backslash player or check out our app and visit SiriusXM.com backslash app. Thank you and have a back pain free day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.